So the important thing with any definition, y'all, is not necessarily memorization, right? Although that was probably what you were taught throughout most of your educational life, right? Memorize this definition. So I'm sorry if I'm going to break that bubble right now. But it needs to be burst, and it should have been burst a long time ago. More importantly is understanding, right? And you can put these things in your own words. They don't have to be in those exact words from Webster's Dictionary or nowadays, you know, Google. <laughs> I had to actually show my son my old dictionary. Cause, but, of course, how do we do his vocabulary homework? He's called Google. Because <laughs> it's faster and easier. But, so when we define something, right, the more important thing is putting it in terms that we understand, right? So, and in that definition, there are certain implications that are embodied in that definition. Now, we've already kind of talked about what viruses are, right? They are either DNA or RNA, right, some type of nucleic acid with a protein coat. So acellular, we know, is what? In this case, A means non-cellular, right? So for yourself, if you want to write instead of acellular, you could write not a cell. <laughs> and that's an important component of this definition, right? It's not a cell, but it does contain some molecules that cells do, like DNA or RNA and protein. So again, often just a protein coat and a nucleic acid genome. You may need a little bit more there than just nucleic acid, right? You may need to write for yourself DNA or RNA. Maybe that makes more sense to you. Lacking independent metabolism. What does that mean? What does metabolism mean? How it gets its nutrients. Metabolism is a sum of all the chemical reactions that happen in a cell. So, especially for these viruses, they can't metabolize, which means also they can't copy themselves, right? What copies them? What copies a virus? The host cell, right? The host cell's machinery copies the virus. Also bringing to the point, right, that they can't replicate without a living cell. So remember, also earlier we said, what are we, they tend to be called outside of a cell? Inactive. Because again, they're not doing anything. They're literally just there. So for me, when, when I define a virus, when I say it's acellular, it's a protein coat with nucleic acid genome, it lacks independent metabolism, and reproducing only within a host cell. I would argue that this is not a living entity. And I would base my argument on the fact that it is not a cell. That simple, right? For me, living has got to be a cell. These are not cells. They infect cells, but they are not cells. So other scientists, especially parasitologists, like my best friend Sarah Brock, she likes to argue, right? And she studies parasites. And some parasites, right, cannot grow on their own. They have to infect another living organism. They cannot exist on their own, right? So that's her argument. She's like, well, par some parasites can't live on their own. I said, yeah, but what do you think my rebuttal is? They have cells. They are at least a cell, right? And although some of them even then cannot metabolize on their own, like there's some bacteria like chlamydia, no mitochondria. 
I mean, no um, independent metabolism. Can't metabolize on its own. Can only replicate inside one of our cells. But again, it's a cell. Still a cell. And for me, that's the definition of a living organism. Right? Is at least a cell. Most organisms, though, are a cell. They can metabolize on their own. They can reproduce on their own. Then, the, but there's some exceptions, like some parasitic parasites, right? Some bacteria even that can't, like chlamydia, metabolize on their own. I'm not very good with the worms. Sarah could name them, but you know there are certain parasites out there again that have to infect a living host, cannot replicate on their own. So that's what we mean by, well, uh, well, what's the implications of this, these concepts in, in body? Like, you know, we, we make these distinctions and, and decisions based on the facts that we know on the things that we study. But again, too, you have to have it in terms that you understand, right? So that you can have a conversation, a discussion about it. Now, do I expect you guys to agree with me? No, you can argue. You can sit on Sarah's side. I'm totally fine with that, but you got to back it up with scientific fact. Right? Known data. And scientists do this all the time, right? We're the, probably more argumentative than lawyers, believe it or not. And determined on our side sometimes, too. To a fault. But if anything, if you're a true scientist, it's based on data, observations, testing what it is we believe to be so. And then the really hard part, accepting when you're wrong. And agreeing to look, go look into other hypotheses, other explanations for what it is that we observe and see and record. So scientists that study viruses are referred to as virologists. And the study, of course, of viruses is virology. And of course, the most widely accepted understanding of viruses is that they are acellular, they're not a cell, right? And they're therefore a lot of times referred to as infectious agents. So they're actually, um, as far as a light microscope, is concerned, they're submicroscopic, right? They're tinier than what we can see with a light microscope. Um, some of them can be cultivated in laboratory settings. And so virology is a sub-discipline, you could say, of microbiology, microbiology being the larger discipline. Just like within biology, we have sub-disciplines. And Marion Pridestad, I probably said her name earlier, um, she studied and st continues to study um, on summer sabbaticals um, poliovirus. So, um, although for the most part, we've, we've pretty much gotten rid of that disease thanks to what? Vaccines and treatment, right? There's still um, much to know about um, that virus. So when we look at viruses, so at this point we've talked about viceroids a little bit and virons and prions. Now we're just going to concentrate on viruses. Um, they have different morphology, which is their shape and how their molecules are, are arranged. Um, and in that, if you're talking about a single virus particle, they're referred to as virons. Just like bacteria, we say bacterium, right? And that would be the singular term for a virus, is a virin, a particular particle. Viruses themselves are referred to as being naked viruses or enveloped viruses. The difference in that enveloped viruses have an envelope. Naked viruses are the minimum to be a virus. So what's 
of virus molecularly wise? Would we say it is? DNA or RNA and a protein coat. So in addition to that, envelope viruses have an envelope. Other terminology that we use are nucleocapsid. Nucleo, what do you think that refers to? What component of a virus? Right, sounds like nucleus, but again, they're not a cell, so it can't be a nucleus. So what are they referring to? The nucleic acid. Capsid is the term we give to the protein coat. The protein coat, of course, are made of proteins, but those proteins can be organized in different ways. Those individual subunits of proteins are commonly referred to as capsomeres. And sometimes they'll be arranged in particular patterns. So pentamers, what do you think that is? Five. Hexamers? Six. So six protein units together. So in addition, the protein coats, those capsomeres, sometimes have quite complex arrangements to them. And um, my favorite is the bacterial phage that we're going to look at. And we've looked at previously in one of the electron micrographs, it kind of looks like a spaceship. It's definitely one of my favorite um, looking viruses. Um, others, um, the protein coat is helical, right? So it's kind of spiral shaped like DNA tends to form a helix. And then there's the isohedral. And actually, I think next time I'm going to bring some in for you guys to make some isohedral. Uh, so as I said, a viron refers to just a single virus particle. And that consists of one or more molecules of DNA or RNA. Remember, it's one or the other, not both encased in a protein coat. They may have additional layers. Again, driving home that point, they can't reproduce on their own or carry out cell division because, of course, they're not a cell. Right? Unlike prokaryotes and eukaryotes, remember the general terms we give to cells. So naked, as I said, naked implies that it doesn't have the envelope. Um, so most of the viruses, I think, they, when they first discovered, were probably enveloped viruses. And then they're like, oh, some of them don't have that layer. They're naked. No, that's just how they are, right? Um, envelope viruses are the ones that we mostly deal with as animals, as humans they have that additional layer. In that layer, they'll have proteins associated with them. They're typically referred to as spikes because they stick out of the envelope layer like a spike would. And these are really important for that initial attachment to the cell it's going to infect. For naked viruses, their protein coat itself, although not shown in this picture, will sometimes have kind of spiky looking proteins that allow them to attach the cells. But at the core, they're both the same, and they're nucleic acid surrounded by a protein coat, what we call the capsid. So remember, these are teeny tiny, about 10 to 400 nanometers in diameter, often too small to be seen with the light microscope. As I defined earlier, nucleocapsid. Nucleo refers to the nucleic acid, which is either DNA or RNA. And capsid refers to the protein coat. So this would be another name you could even give to a naked virus, right? It's a nucleocapsid. If you say it's an envelope virus, it's a nucleocapsid with an envelope, right? That extra layer. Capses are quite large macromolecular structures, which means they're made up of 
multiple molecules. All right, so they're made out of protein, but lots of proteins organized in this much larger macro molecule. So we're not talking about just one protein, but multiple proteins. And of course, as any coat would, right, it helps protect. In this case, the precious nucleic acid. But it's also usually, especially for naked viruses, that interaction with the host cell. Right? That protein coat is what comes in contact with the cell, the host cell it's going to invade. Where envelope viruses is the proteins associated with the envelope. The individual proteins themselves are referred to as protomers. And so those protomers, those protein subunits that make up the capsid, that protein coat, can be arranged in different ways. So uh, the tobacco mosaic virus, which is what's shown over here on the right, is an RNA virus. So you see the RNA ribbon here. And then the protomers, the individual protein subunits, attach to the RNA in a helical fashion. So much so that it almost looks like a bullet or a tube, right? And this, of course, infects uh, tobacco plants. The influenza virus that none of us like <laughs> actually has more than one segment of nucleic acid. I'm pretty sure it's an RNA virus. Don't quote me on it. Probably have it written down later on. Um, is like the tobacco mosaic virus in that it's helical, but you see there's more than one piece in here, right? So here's the nucleic acid. It's surrounded by the protomers in a helical fashion. But when you look at the virus, you see, right, these almost spherical, mostly because they're squished together. If you were to look at it all by itself, it'd be spherical because all those nucleocapsids, are encased in an envelope. And for the most part, envelopes are going to be spherical. So this guy, when you first look at it just on the outside, it looks spherical. But if you actually look at the proteins and how they're arranged with the nucleic acid, it's actually helical. The next one is isohedral, and so this you can really appreciate. I have some models that I'll um, actually bring to the exam, I think, Thursday night, um, and then I'll even give you guys some little paper models you can make um, where you can see this um, three-dimensional structure. So you can see the regular polyhedrals, right, This, uh, this all the sides are equal distance, right? Iso means the same. Um, there are 20 lateral faces, if you were to count them, and 12 vertices, these points sticking out. This is apparently nature's favorite, one of nature's favorite shapes. It's very uh, common in nature. And particularly for this one, the, the subunits are referred to as capsomeres. And so uh, out of those, they'll tend to even have rings or knob-shaped units made up of five or six protomers. So you have um, what we call pentamers, where it's five of them together, and hexamers, which is six. And in this next picture, you can kind of see this. So do you see the, the kind of pink ones? See how there's five of them at this point, at this vertices? So there's a pentamer arrangement. And then over here that spreads over two um, faces, you see six. That's a hexamere. And then you can see this one is, I think, an enveloped one. But in addition, you see the five. Isn't that pretty? Almost like a flower. All right. And here's another one where it has the, the knobs extending. But then look, this pattern repeats. Look at five around the vertices. 
So I think I've got it posted for you guys too already, but I'll print some up. I might even go big and, and go to Office Depot and print in color. So you guys can see the different subunits. This is, and I always say it wrong, I think it's Dungy or yeah, I think it's Dungy virus. Dungy. Model two PowerPoint. Oh, there it is. So this is a particular virus. This is the Dungy Dungy virus. But I'll, I'll print these out for you guys Thursday. So it doesn't look like much, right? Because it's flat right now. But if you cut it out and you fold along these lines for all the triangles and you fold it all up, it becomes that isohedral. And you notice the different colors and you can kind of see right here. Look at the blues. One, two, three, four, five. At the points, there's that pent pentamere. Um, for this particular virus. And you can search on the internet, there's a whole bunch of them where they figured out, you know, the different protein structures and how they're arranged and you can cut them out and fold them up. This is one of the ones that comes up the most often. It's pretty cool. So we'll do, we'll do that on Thursday. It'll be a good little icebreaker after our exam or before. And you'll actually notice in the computer lab there, if someone hasn't stolen it, I gave it to them as a little nerd joke. I told them I hope that's the only virus they ever see. <laughs> told you my jokes are corny. This morning, the high school students that are here, he's like, you remind me of my teacher. She's funny too, but she's corny too. Ah, uh, you know, we do the best we can with what we've got. So we have ones that are helical, we have ones that are isohedral, and then you have some that are quite complex, <laughs> right? Uh, like the pox virus, or my favorite, the large bacterial phage, or just sometimes referred to as bacterial viruses. So here's the um, pox virus. So it has a region that, that, that contains the nucleic acid that's sometimes even referred to as the nucleoid, a term that we use for bacteria, remember. Um, it has this core membrane, um, these lateral bodies, and an outer envelope, really strange looking virus. And then this guy is the bacterial phage. Um, so a lot of the bacterial viruses are this really complex um, structure where you have a, a capsid and, and sometimes this will be isohedral. I think this one is a little more stretched right here so it's another shape I can't think of right now with the nucleic acid on the inside and then you have this really complex you know collar and sheath and these tail pins and these tail fibers and there's really cool I need to find it again there's some cool animations that scientists have done and post on places like YouTube, um, where it shows this basically landing like a spaceship would on the surface of a bacterial cell. And this lands, literally smashes into the bacteria, and then this portion compresses and injects the nucleic acid into the bacteria. Because remember, bacteria have what layer that's really hard to breach? the peptidoglycan, the cell wall. So unlike with animal viruses that we're going to see in a moment, where the whole virus enters into our cells, or at least the nucleocapsid does, that doesn't happen for bacteria. Just the nucleic acid and any enzymes in there that they need get injected in. It's, it's too hard to get the whole virus in. But that's also why it has this strange, like, spaceship-looking structure. It's meant to be able to attach and get the important stuff inside and infect that cell. So at one time, they thought, you know, it's just nucleic acid. That's all they've got. But come to find out um, that some of them actually have 
um, enzymes and uh, that are inside the, the capsid. Or some of them, actually, some of those proteins that are associated with the capsid itself or embedded within the envelope are actually enzymatic. Can actually catalyze specific reactions. But again, doesn't do anything for the virus outside of a cell. But these enzymes do stuff inside of the cell. So we'll look at some specific examples of this. So and again, a lot of the ones that infect us have an envelope layer. And the envelope is actually derived from our membrane. But they convert it into their envelope. They insert their proteins into it. They change the structure of it. So that it's no longer our membrane. It's their envelope. And so those, most of those proteins and stuff, they stick in the membrane to make it into an envelope are referred to as spikes, especially when they stick out. But pleplomere, uh, pleplomeres is also another name that you'll rarely see. So here's some examples. Here's the hepatitis um, virus. Um, so you can see its spikes associated with one of the hepatitis viruses. Here's the rabies virus. It has a very characteristic shape to it even. It has this bullet shape to this particular virus and, and these very characteristic um, spikes to it. So at first we thought that they lacked enzymes, but then as we continued to study them we found that some of them have enzymes either associated with the envelope or the capsid, and then even some within that protein capsid coat. Which it really makes sense too, again, when we're dealing with RNA viruses, because remember, our cells aren't equipped to copy RNA into RNA. Well, if you're an RNA virus and you need to replicate yourself, you need to make copies of RNA. So some of them come with their own enzymes in order to do that. So we've already mentioned, right, that viruses are going to be DNA or RNA. We didn't say about how that those molecules are arranged. We know from our own experience, right, typically when we say DNA, it's double-stranded, right? In our cells, DNA is double-stranded. And RNA is single-stranded. Well, guess what? For viruses, they can have single-stranded DNA. They can have double-stranded RNA. So to denote that, again, scientists typically, especially virologists, will refer to a virus by whether it's a DNA or RNA virus, but they may even go one step further and say it's a single-stranded DNA virus. So they would code that SS for single-stranded. Or if it's double-stranded, it's DS, right? Double-stranded. For RNA, too, they may denote that it's single-stranded or it's double-stranded. They may continue to talk about its structure. They may say it's linear, like what we're used to with our chromosomes, right? Our chromosomes, our DNA is just lined up, where in most bacteria, it's actually circular, right? It's a closed circle. So the same is true for these guys. They can be linear. They can be circular. In the case of the influenza virus, did you guys notice? It's linear, right, with proteins arranged helically around it and then surrounded in an envelope. The size of the nucleic acid is going to vary virus to virus. So you could be talking about 10,000 base pairs. You could be talking about 600,000 base pairs. And just like bacteria or other organisms, how much DNA doesn't really determine how bad an organism it is, right? 
Believe it or not, organisms can do a whole lot of what we consider bad stuff with just a little bit of information. Right? Just depends on how powerful your gun is, for instance. Right? When we talk about RNA, we run into some difficulties again because typically cells go DNA, RNA, protein. If you are single-stranded RNA, because of how cells read RNA, it depends on which strand of RNA you are. Because remember, they're complementary to one another just like DNA is complementary. Each strand is the same, but it goes in the opposite direction, right? And enzymes read directionally, right? They go from one side to the other. So like we, we write left to right. Yeah, that's what we do. Some, some cultures, right? Other languages, they write the other way or even down. Okay? Enzymes always read just like we always write the same way. They always read the same way when it comes to directional molecules, which DNA and RNA are directional. You have what's called the 5' prime and the 3' prime end, right? Whether it's the phosphate sticking out or the sugar. This tells the enzyme where to attach and what direction to go in. It's typically 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So one strand goes that way, the other strand goes the other way. Still with me? So if you are RNA, you're either 5' prime to 3' prime or 3' prime to 5'. Prime. So how we denote the two different strands is we either say plus or minus or positive and negative. Here it says plus and negative. But plus and positive are pretty much the same thing in our minds, right? And they are used interchangeably, unfortunately, sometimes. And negative and minus being relatively the same thing in this instance. So RNA is translated by ribosomes into protein, right? Guess which one gets translated? Plus or minus? Well, if I said your bank account is in the plus or it's in the negative? Which one would you be happy about? The plus, right? Negative means, oh crap, right? I've got a huge surcharge, this is not gonna be good. And I have no money, right? Negative means no money. <laughs> it's not good, right? So which do you think would be good as far as RNA? Plus, right? Human nature makes sense, right? So. Plus or positive RNA are basically the same as messenger RNA. It's the same direction. So ribosomes will attach to it and read it, make the protein no problem. Minus or negative is when you run into problems, right? Because is the ribosome going to read it? No. So the influenza virus which is RNA. Did I say RNA earlier? Yes. I told you it was later on. I don't know why I can't remember at the beginning of the lecture. So it's an RNA virus. Its genetic material, right, is RNA. It carries with it an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So that means it's an enzyme that makes RNA from RNA, which is good because what type of virus is it? An RNA virus. This enzyme too 
both replicates. It's a replicase, which means it does what? Replicates. What's another word for replicate? Copies. So it's going to copy itself, and it's going to make, it's a transcriptase, right, which means that it's going to make the other complementary strand to the strands it is, and make messenger RNA, so what can read it and make the proteins? The ribosome. It has to bring this own enzyme because will our cells have an enzyme to make RNA into RNA and minus strand RNA into plus strand messenger RNA? No, because what do we do in our cells? Where does our how do we make messenger RNA? Where's all our information stored? In the DNA. We go DNA, RNA, protein, right? In this case, they are just RNA. Even worse, they're negative strand RNA. Ribosome can't read that stuff. So they've got to come with their own special enzyme that's going to make their minus strand into plus strand messenger RNA that can be read by the cell, and it's got to copy its own RNA in order to make more of itself. So why doesn't it do it outside of the cell? Why doesn't it just copy itself outside? It's got its own enzyme. Lazy, isn't it? No, what does it not have outside of that cell? Yeah, metabolism. What do you need for metabolism? You need building blocks, right? Why do we eat? Do you have the building blocks, right? We have the enzymes to do it, but we've got to give it the building blocks to do it. So what happens when a virus goes inside of the cell? It gets all the building blocks. So even though it has its own enzyme, outside of the cell it can't do anything because it doesn't have the building blocks. When it invades the cell, it uses the cell's building blocks, the cell's ribonucleic acid building blocks, the nucleotides, and builds more of its own messenger, its own RNA, excuse me, and then copies its RNA into messenger RNA. And then the cell's ribosomes uses the cell's amino acids and builds the protein to make the protein coat. And uses the cell's amino acids and ribosomes to make the proteins that then get embedded into the membrane that then becomes the envelope of that virus. Right. So it's like a mad scientist taking over a factory. Right? He's like, hee 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 hee, you no longer gonna make Nike sneakers, you're gonna make supersonic sneakers. Right? Because that's what I'm all about. That virus takes over that machine, right, that factory, and says, oh, you're not going to make any more of you or whatever you were making. You're going to make what I'm telling you to make, me, and lots of me. Still with me? That's what influenza virus is, negative stranded. Because it's negative strand, it's not the same as messenger RNA. So we can't go messenger RNA to protein. They've got to do extra steps. They've got to turn their negative strand into plus strand messenger RNA. They got to copy their own RNA with their own vi with their own enzyme. So their enzyme comes with them. Because our cells don't have that ability, right? They don't do that. That's not normal operating procedures. So because they're different, because they're negative-stranded RNA, they've got to come with their own enzyme that will copy them and turn them into messenger RNA or trans translate their, their RNA into messenger RNA. Positive doesn't have to do that because positive is already the same as messenger RNA. Ribosomes can read it. But they usually do need their own enzyme to copy their own RNA. And then some of them are really tricky, like HIV, it goes backwards. It actually makes DNA from its RNA. 
and then that RNA directs the production of more uh, of a more RNA and messenger RNA. That's why they're called a, a retrovirus. Tricky buggers. So, life cycle, and again, you know, I mean, it's terminology that sounds like life, right? So we should just call it like copy cycle. <laughs> right? But a replication cycle, right? How do they copy themselves? How do they replicate themselves? And this varies um, depending on the virus and, and who they're infecting, right? Because we've already talked about some of these barriers that different viruses run into, like bacteria viruses have got the whole problem of the cell wall and, you know, all that fun stuff. So we'll go over the general steps that have got to happen in order for them to replicate themselves. But then for the specialty areas, like entry is a big specialty that really differs for plants versus vertebrate animals and bacteria because of the vast differences in those different types of hosts, right? Plant cells are different than bacteria cells and animal cells are different from all of them. So entry has got to be specialized, right, for getting into those types of cells. So the number one thing that always has to happen is it has to attach to the host cell. It has to recognize it and physically attach to it. And of course, this is mainly mediated by those proteins in the capsid or the envelope layer. How it actually gains entry, how the virus or the components of the virus that are infectious get in is going to vary depending on the host. So we'll look at different hosts separately. Then once those pieces are in that are needed, then synthesis happens, right? They're going to copy the RNA or copy the DNA, make all the proteins, convert that cell into a virus-making factory. For the most part, our level of understanding is that these nucleic acids and the proteins self-assemble. Like they don't need additional molecules to help them figure out where they're supposed to go. They just like, boop, go together. Of course, probably as we study more, there may be some chaperoning happening there. We just aren't seeing it yet. But it's possible because it's actually quite amazing because molecules, you know, interact with each other in specific ways. So for instance, uh, the phospholipids that make up membranes, if you stick them in water, they're always going to form micelles, right? The phosphate heads always stick out and all the fatty acids are in the middle, right? And, and then again, it's due to the natural properties of these molecules in interactions with each other, right? Those phosphate groups are charged. They're all about getting along with water. Those darn fatty acids, not charged, very hydrophobic, they're like, get away from me, right? Protect me. Don't let that stuff near me. Right? They all congregate together. So for the most part, right, they believe that happens with, with viruses, right? The nucleic acid just automatically gets surrounded by the protein coat. Those proteins embed into the envelope, uh, into the membrane and form the envelope. So because some of them are enveloped and actually convert the membrane of the cells they infect into their envelope, um, how they leave the cell, right, that release varies depending on whether it's an envelope virus versus a naked virus. Here they're just showing a naked virus, so they're just busting out of the cell. So for plants... Normally, viruses can't enter plant cells. They only get in if mechanical abrasion or insects assist. And again, what barrier is stopping most viruses from getting into these cells? The cell wall, right? So insects, as we know, can penetrate that. And mechanical abrasion can actually be as simple as the wind, right? Um, creating a break in a, in a leaf. In a stem. Some plants are unfortunately that fragile. 
Vertebrate viruses only infect certain tissues in certain organisms because there's a specific interaction between the receptors on the surface and the host cell molecules. So one of the most popular examples is the measles virus. That receptor that that virus attaches to, unfortunately, is present in most of the tissues of your body. So that's why you get massive dissemination of that virus throughout the body and why it can be um, life-threatening. You're dealing with massive invasion <laughs> on a large scale. Poliovirus, on the other hand, the receptors are present only in a select few. So that's why that particular disease, right, targets particular areas of the body. Because we are multi-celled organisms, right, and not all our cells are the same, and they communicate with each other differently, they have different receptors on them. So one of one of the most amazing examples of how intimate this interaction is, um, is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. That virus attaches to a specific receptor on our cells. And the reason why it can cause the immune system to potentially become deficient is because it attacks one of our immune cells. Anyone know what immune cell it attacks? T cells. Specifically, there you have two main types of T cells. You have helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. And unfortunately, guess who's the probably more important one? The helpers, because they do just that, they help out other cells, are what get infected. And that recept one of the receptors that helps us actually determine that it's a helper T cell is called the CD4 marker stands for clusters of differentiation because they were these clusters of proteins we saw on the surface of the membranes and we found, oh, this differentiates one cell from another, right? It's kind of its tag, its special marker. Unfortunately, that's what the HIV virus attaches to, is that specific marker. And that's how it gains entry into that cell. And then, of course, it causes that cell to make more copies of itself. It busts out and affects even more cells. So if our body can't keep up re reproducing these cells that are being debilitated by the virus, then you get to a status where your immune system is severely compromised, and you're said to have, what, AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, because it was a list of symptoms. At one time, they didn't know what was causing it. And you can quote unquote get AIDS from something other than HIV because it just means acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. But AIDS and, and HIV have actually become pretty much synonymous, but they are not the same thing. Someone can actually, thanks to the new therapies and drugs and things that we have available today, someone could be living with HIV infection and not progress to the status of AIDS where their immune system is deficient. That's the really scary thing, because now your immune system is no longer functioning, right? It's deficient. So you die because you can't defend yourself. You actually don't die from HIV or quote-unquote AIDS, which is just a condition. You die from what? Secondary infection number one being pneumonia. It's the number one killer because, I mean, stuff you breathe in all the time, some of us can usually take care of. They can't. Right? And it gets them. So, did I tell you guys about the tribe in Africa? Right? Genetically immune. Right? Their CD4 markers, different so different that the HIV virus, and there's actually two types of HIV, type 1 and type 2. I don't know if they're immune against both. Um, type 1, of course, is the most common, but there's also type 2, which is slightly different, obviously, than type 1. Um, so that's really interesting. I mean, it just really homes in on the fact of how specific that interaction is. Right? And that one's a really specific when it comes to HIV.
it's pretty much one cell that's pretty debilitating. It can affect also the macrophages because some of them do have that marker as well. And those are very important cells that we'll talk about in immunology because they, they devour um, and eat phagocytized um, pathogens that come in the body, and microbes in general. So they really aid in our defense. So they're big eaters, hence macrophage. Um, so if it's an enveloped virus like you see here, one of the ways they can get into host cells with membranes is that those spikes in the envelope can bind to receptors. And again, these are things that are normally present on our cells that are going to allow our cells to communicate with each other, and they're just taking advantage of this being here. And they've adapted that their proteins can bind to our receptors that are naturally present on our cells. And that can cause the cell to um, fuse its membrane with the envelope. And so that's what you see happening here. And then therefore the nucleocapsid, the nucleic acid with the protein coat, then gains entry into the cell. And then takes over. The other thing that can happen is that when it binds to the receptors, it can cause the cell to engulf it within a vesicle. This is referred to as endocytosis. So in this case, the cell's membrane surrounds the envelope of the virus and encases it into a vesicle. But then the vesicle itself peels off the envelope of the virus and releases the nucleocapsid inside the cell. The bad news is it gets in, right? Naked viruses, again, their proteins associated with their capsid, with their protein layer, are going to bind to receptors on our cells. And typically, they're going to cause our cells to endocytose them, to engulf them with our own membrane. So our membrane surrounds them. But because this is not an enveloped virus, you can't peel off the envelope and release the nucleocapsid. Right? The vesicle is actually attached to the protein coat. So in this case, the really important stuff just comes out, the nucleic acid and any enzymes necessary escape the vesicle. So some viruses, as we saw, the whole thing goes in, right? Gets endocytosed or um, fuses with the membrane. Whereas others must ensure that the virus-associated DNA or RNA and any polymerases, any enzymes that it has, get introduced into the cell. And especially for bacteria, the most common thing is, is that it injects it in almost, right, with this really cool spaceship-looking structure. And the nucleic acid, whether it be DNA or RNA, gets injected into the cell along with any of its enzymes, right, DNA or RNA polymerases that may be necessary for its replication and um, transcription, translation of the proteins necessary to form new viruses. So most double-stranded DNA viruses use their DNA as the template for messenger RNA synthesis. So, you know, this is what we're used to in our cells. Our cells can do this. And then that messenger RNA is turned into the viral proteins. As we talked about already, RNA viruses may require additional steps depending on whether it's positive strand or negative strand. You know, and some of them, like I said, are kind of funky. They kind of go backwards even, right? Go RNA to DNA that then directs to RNA. Or some that just copy their own RNA and make messenger RNA from it.
So it's complex. It's not, you know, as easy as throwing molecules in water, but apparently a self-assembly process. It involves viral proteins as well as some host cell factors, right? So some components in the cell actually aid in the assembly of the virus. Some of them will form these um, large pericrystalline uh, structures at the site of maturation. So as they're assembling inside the cell, like you, you get this weird like scaffolding type um, situation. And probably one of the best examples of that that's really important diagnostically is with rabies infection. Um, so I actually did a search last semester, but I put it at the end of this talk because they're specifically related to our cells, right? Um, human cells, animal cells. Um, so I don't know if you can see it, not so well in this picture, but you see right here, right here, right here. So in this Purkinje cell are these specific inclusion bodies that they refer to as nigra bodies. So this specific, specific formation you're seeing here, do you guys see those there? Oh, you can actually see them better on up there than I can on my screen. <laughs> That's good. And then there's one little one here in this picture. So these, these are specific to the rabies virus. So um, at the vet school at, at LSU in Baton Rouge, if you drop off a raccoon, I'm, I got news for you, they don't try and rehabilitate it or anything. They immediately kill it and send it for necropsy to see if it has rabies because raccoons are the number one carriers of rabies in Louisiana. They don't even mess with them. And so this is one of the things they'll do is they'll prepare slides from the brain and they're looking specifically for these Niagara bodies to see if it was infected with rabies. Right, because of these, these paracrine, you know, these inclusion bodies that form um, when you have rabies infection. I'll rewind now. <laughs> and I really wanted to show that to you guys when we were talking about it. Give you an actual real world example of how they form these specific congregations that can be identified even under the microscope. So T4 is the name of a, a phage a bacterial virus that infects E. coli. Um, It'll produce about 150 viral particles um, from a single cell. So one virus goes in, it produces 150 that bust out of that one E. coli cell. Uh, in addition, it produces two proteins that are involved in this process of actually leaving the cell. One is lysozyme, which actually is an enzyme we produce. Um, it degrades peptidoglycan which is the substance that the cell wall of bacteria is made out of. And then it produces the enzyme holin, which as the name implies, it pokes holes in the plasma membrane. So even though it injected its nucleic acid in and any enzymes and it copied itself, it's still got to get out of that cell to infect other cells. In order to achieve that, it degrades the cell wall, the peptidoglycan with lysozyme, and it pokes holes in the membrane so that it then can bust out of the cell. So that's all of them getting out of the cell. Poor dead E. coli. So all viral envelopes are derived from the cell's membrane, right? They make their own proteins, they insert it into the membrane and turn that membrane actually into an envelope for that virus. Naked viruses don't need an envelope, right? They're just nucleic acid protein. They can just bust out of the cells like you saw for that E. coli. Enveloped in viruses is a little bit more complicated process because they're turning that cell's membrane into their envelope. So they've got to pick up that membrane as they leave that cell. So a lot of them do a process that's referred to as budding, right? Where one will come off, off the cell, another one will bud off, right? Until basically there's no 
um, envelope left and the cell is deteriorated and gone and now you have all these viruses. So remember the spikes? So these are the proteins in the envelope. So back to good old friend influenza, right, who's not so friendly, but <laughs> we're talking about him a lot. Um, there are two main spikes that are very important for um, its uh, replication and infection. One is called hemagglutin. The other is neuroaminodase. And as it implies, right, whenever we say ACE, we're usually referring to what type of molecules? Enzymes. Yeah. Most of the time when you talk about a molecule and it ends in ASE, we're referring to an enzyme. So as you can imagine, right, neuroaminodase is an enzyme. So here's good old influenza, right? So remember, RNA virus, uh, helical capsomere, right? Protein coat. And then there's many pieces actually that get incorporated into another protein matrix that then attaches to the now modified plasma membrane that has the viral proteins in it, one of it being neuroaminidase, one being hemagglutin. So, which one do you think of the influenza appears to be involved in the attachment to the host cell receptor? Do you think it's the neuroaminodase or the hemagglutin? What does hemagglutin sound like? Blood, right? So believe it or not, this one will actually cause your blood to clump up. Right, that's the one, agglutin sounds like agglutination, clumping, right? That's the one that attaches to your cells, hemagglutin. That's the un, one of the unfortunate ones that changes each year, right? These guys mutate, they change their RNA, they make different combinations of this protein that attaches to us, so that's why we need a new vaccine each year because we're trying to guess what it's going to look like so we can make antibodies against it and stop it from sticking to us, right? Because if you have an antibody, the antibody binds to the virus and the virus can't bind to your cells and it can't get it. And then your immune cells gobble it up and throw it out with the trash. That's the ideal scenario, right? Unfortunately, we don't always guess right each year as to what might be coming around our way. So, okay, that's all well and fine, right? So they attach to us, right? They get in. This is actually showing them budding out of us. So what the heck is the neuroaminodase? <laughs> it's an enzyme, right? When our cells take in the influenza virus, it activates that enzyme. What that enzyme does is it shuts down our expression of the receptors that hemagglutin binds to. Okay, so they get in and they basically close all the doors and windows to all their virus buddies, right? They're like, ha, ah, my house, you ain't getting in. You are not getting in. Ain't is not a word. So I keep telling my son that, but yet I just said it. <laughs> Why would that be beneficial? Why would a virus get inside your cell and say, oh, this one's mine. None of my buddies can come in. No, no, no. This is my house. You stay outside. Doesn't have to compete. He's like, I'm not sharing. This is mine. This is my factory. This is my house. You cannot come in here. So he doesn't have to share. He doesn't have to compete. Well, that's not good for us, is it? Because if he's not sharing, where does it mean all his buddies are going? <laughs> Into other cells. This is why influenza is so crappy. Because they don't share. They're like, nope, this one's my cell, so all his buddies that you also inhaled at the same time have to find their own cell. And then when they bust out of that cell, they don't share again. 
right? So you've got hundreds of cells that have each their own very little virus in it, and then they replicate and they bust out, and now you have hundreds more, thousands more that have got to go find new cells. Massive destruction of cells on a massive scale. This is why you feel like you've been run over by a truck. Because you basically have been. It's called the influenza virus. They are destroying you on a massive scale. Until your body can get it under control, which can take a while, you're dealing with serious invasion. Serious, greedy invaders. So on that scary note, we're going to talk about life cycles after the exam on Thursday. If you feel confident, which I'm fine if you just concentrate on test one stuff, but if you feel up to it, there's a bonus connect you may have noticed that's basically animation. So if you're one of those people that like watching this stuff move kind of helps you understand it, then maybe watch that before the next lecture, but it's fine if you watch it after. Okay? You with me? All right.